Welcome to The Mick Show, where I give you a laid-back look at the lives and businesses of today's most well-respected creatives. You'll learn key life lessons from culture's most prominent personalities, musicians, actors, athletes, and CEOs. So sit back, relax, and let's get into the show. This is The Mick Show. Welcome to episode five of The Mix Show. Our guest this week is a very special guest, Axel Alonzo. I don't know how to say this without using this word, but I got to use it. He is simply marvelous. He is one of the most important people, honestly, in my opinion, in comic book history. His reign as editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics produced so many amazing things that you love, your kids love, your cousins love, your friends love, whether it was going to the movie theaters to see an updated current version of Avengers or checking out all the amazing diversity and inclusion that's in comic books now, including my son's favorite character, Miles Morales, the new Spider-Man. Axel has his DNA over that entire process. Since leaving Marvel, he went on to start a new company, AWA Studios, which has actually one of the most important and successful comics of 2020. It's called The Resistance, and they actually, this is scary, they predicted the pandemic a year before it happened. It's kind of scary reading it. It's kind of eerie and it's pretty spot on. I've been a fan of Axel's for a long time as just a huge comic book fan over the last 20 years. And it's really, really a privilege to have him on the mix show. Don't forget, if you do love the mix show, make sure wherever you're listening to this show, leave us a review, leave us a rating, give us some stars. We can grow with your help and we're super excited about that. So thank you so much for taking a couple seconds to do that. And once again, let's get into episode five of The Mix Show. Mr. Axel Alonzo, what's up, man? Not much. I'm quarantined like you in my bedroom. In your bedroom. (laughs) Nice. I'm in my office, but I clean it up before I do these interviews. That chair is usually over here and there's usually shoes and my kid's scooter, but, you know, we clean it up. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the legendary things this man has done, I mean, almost any superhero you heard of, almost every billion dollar movie that you've been to, every my God, diversity in comics, like what has since your hands touched in, over the last 20 years? And I want to delve into that because I think it's super important. You were the former editor-in-chief of Marvel and Comics. I love what you did because most comic creators leave the big two and they go to the independent stuff, but you don't hear it a lot from like an editorial perspective. And I think that's really cool and entrepreneurial. So we're going to get in all of that. But sure. I guess the first thing um, I want to talk to you about is like, how did you get your start in comics? Oh, yeah. So I was a journalist. I read comic books, only like graphic novels. I never went to the comic book store. I wasn't a guy that went to the store every Wednesday. I hadn't read superheroes in years. I saw an ad in the New York Times for an editor at DC Comics. So I sent in my resume just on a lark. I went to an interview with an editor named Lou Stathis. And Lou said, I've been wanting to meet you. I'm like, what? He says, you wrote an article I read I loved. Oh, wow. For the Daily News. I know you've got an uncommon name. Yeah, I wrote that, I said. So it turns out that Lou liked my article because I'd written an article for the Daily News about the use of the cannabis leaf in pop culture. And in the article, I'd interviewed the head for marijuana enforcement laws in the DEA and also the editor-in-chief of High Times Magazine. They both represented polar views on the cannabis leaf. Right. And Lou liked the article because the quotes I'd used from the editor-in-chief of High Times made him look kind of silly. And that editor had stolen Lou's girlfriend. Oh, wow. He loved me because you made that guy look like the jackass he is. Thank you. Said, you're welcome. <laughs> you want the job? I had to think about it because the pay sucked. So I thought about it and I eventually decided I was going to do it, but the pay was really bad and it wasn't a lateral move for me to go from uh, journalism to comics. It was a downward move, but I thought, what the hell? I'm going to try it out. I made my way at Vertigo and I enjoyed myself. I fell in love with creating comic books and it's, I mean, I've been doing it ever since. I love that. That's crazy. So I was just thinking about like how the whole entertainment industry would be shifted if that guy wasn't a dick to his girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, wow. Yeah. No, wow. but funny, because I never would have been in comics if he didn't remember my name. He read an article, he remembered my name. If my name had been Joe Smith, he'd have never known. But Axel Alonso is not a common name. Right. So he said, where do I know that name from? Wait a minute. That's the guy who wrote that article. Shout out yeah. to your parents, right? Shout out to your parents for being bold that day. <laughs> yeah. I love it. My dad is Mexican and my mom is English, and they gave me a Danish name. Nice. So, yeah. I guess that averages out if you add up the latitude yeah. and the longitude, you, you get exactly. Danish. <laughs> I don't know. My son is named Miles after Miles Morales because my kid is a mixed kid growing up in Brooklyn. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, the most famous mixed kid in Brooklyn in the world right now is Miles Morales. 
And so it's just like, and having been a fan of what you guys have done forever, when my kid was born, I was like, what's a better role model for him to have than literally the world's coolest superhero who looks like him is a kid, lives a couple blocks, you know, in fantasy yeah. from where we live, and he could look up to him forever. His first movie he ever saw in a theater was Spider-Verse, you know? Yeah, well, brother, look, I mean, the thing is, when I hear stuff like that, it's meaningful to me because one, I pushed to do a black Spider-Man a mixed race Spider-Man, and we announced the news, I got crucified by the comic book fans. They would yell at me saying that I was ruining their childhoods. Peter Parker's Spider-Man. This guy's not Spider-Man. And I always thought to myself, there's such a beauty in having that Spider-Man mask peel back to show a different face. Right. Go for other kids. Whole new kids can see themselves reflected in him. That's important. Yeah. Hence Miles, you know? I know my kid gave him such an entry point into that whole culture because he saw a point of like recognition. Yeah. It's pretty great. And then just watch him discover everything else. And then his, it's just fascinating. His entry point, I'm watching him discover Marvel and DC and Transformers and all the stuff that we grew up loving, but how he experiences it because of the diversity aspects to it. It's so much more fascinating. I just knew every robot was a man. Every hero was a man. Most of the heroes were white. They were all American. And then for him to be like, you know, Spider-Gwen and Miles and even with Transformers now, there's like girl Transformers and, and there's all sorts of stuff going on. I know IDW has done a great job developing that universe. When I grew up, there were mostly white superheroes, a few black superheroes, and that was it. Yeah. There were Hispanic superheroes. They were any good. Again, your kid is mixed race. I'm mixed race. My kids are mixed race. It's good that they can see the reflection. When I did Amadeus show, when he became the new Hulk, I was yeah. very similar to yours. When we announced that Amadeus Cho, the Korean teenager, was going to become the new Hulk a few years ago, I got a text in the middle of the night from my wife's cousin. And she said, Miles, my son who's four years old, can't get to sleep tonight. You need to speak with him. I said, why? She said, Miles just read the article that Amadeus Cho is the new Hulk. And he's terrified he's going to be the next Hulk now. So I had to get on the phone with this four-year-old and tell him, dude, listen, relax. You're not going to become the Hulk. And even if you do, it's good news. You're going to be super strong. I got off the phone. I got a text back. Thank you. He's asleep now. Thank you so much. But I thought to myself, it's beautiful. For the first time, Miles could imagine himself being the Hulk. Yeah. That's me. And he couldn't do it before. And ironically, his name's Miles, right? So like, it comes like completely yeah. full circle exactly. in that regard. So you did DC and then you came over to Marvel in what year? 2000. Marvel was in chapter 11. Everyone said I was crazy to go. They said, Marvel's going to go under. And I thought, how does a company with Spider-Man, the X-Men, and the Hulk go under? Right, household names, just, basically. Right. It doesn't make any sense to me. So I went. And we turned Marvel around that year and publishing, and then the rest is history. It get built and built and built, and then the movies came out, and boom. I remember my re-entry point to comics because I lapsed out after high school and got into music and went to college and all of that. And then I remember yeah. my re-entry point was around 2005, like golden era of like the new Avengers and all of that stuff. And it was so much more relatable and so much more real. And it reminded me much more of like, the great stuff I was seeing on TV versus some of the campy stuff that I remember from the 80s, which of course I loved as well. And then once that happened, I was absolutely hooked again. And then a couple of years later, it was so interesting to see how you guys created like trillion dollar movies off of these concepts. I mean, how much of your creative thought process was contemporizing these properties so that they're not just resonating with the old school well, fans? I can speak for myself. My goal was always to embrace new fans and people that weren't reading comics. People that are reading Spider-Man, they're going to keep reading Spider-Man. Let's find people that haven't and don't care. I want to get the vertical readers, the independent readers, people that watched wonderful cable TV shows, you know, edgy cable TV shows. It was all about contemporizing them and making them relevant. You know, one of the first things I did was I said, I looked at the Captain America mythology and I said, you know what? I don't buy that Uncle Sam would have tested white boys with a super soldier serum. It just doesn't make any sense as a historical precedent. So I spoke with the writer, Robert Morales. He said, I'll write that. And Kyle Baker would do it. But imagine a world in which the U.S. government tested the super soldier serum, a group of African-American men. There's a man named Isaiah Bradley, who, in fact, was injected with the serum before Steve Rogers was. Right. Fans flipped out. They freaked out like they did when we introduced Miles Morales. You're ruining my childhood. Captain America is Steve Rogers. And we said, yes, he is Steve Rogers. Here's another story. It's incendiary, but it, it was necessary. I feel validated now because you've seen Sam Wilson become Captain America, a female right. Thor. Whenever we did that stuff in Marvel, the old school fans yelled and told you, you suck. You're ruining everything. You don't respect the characters. 
you know, and the thing is, Miles Morales was a star of Into the Spider-Verse. In my mind, the best Spider-Man movie. Yeah, it's an incredible movie. You know, one of the best movies for kids, too. Accessible to adults, but wonderful for kids. And again, to think that that started in a comic book that people yelled about, the comic fans yelled about and whined about. It's funny. You, you see that with, you know, rappers changing producers and evolving with the times. You see it with basketball players changing teams. You know, you, you see it like people become so slow to like embrace change. I mean, we're all victims of that too, but at the same time, it's just like, yeah, life goes on, life evolves and we have to move forward. With it. Especially to a hip hop, you're right. Because I, I have so many friends, like you and I are world hip hop heads and I'll always bounce to the, the 90s stuff. 93 was the golden year. You know, I mean, again, yeah. there's all this great stuff. That sweet spot in 93, 96. But again, I'm big on Gunna and Young Boy Never Broke. And down the list, I love this new stuff. My old friends, I can't get into this stuff, this trap music. And I feel like it's like, uh, get off my lawn, kids. Get off my lawn. It's like hip hop is evolving. It's yeah. changing. Yes, kids are owning it. They're doing their thing with it. It's time for a new generation to bring their energy to it. With all mediums, with comic books, with hip hop, with anything, with sports. People learning new moves, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, I remember dunks and three pointers were considered like you were going to hell if you dunked like in the 40s and 50s. And like, you know, like, not, like dunking was considered rude and three pointers didn't even exist. It was kind of like a show off move. And now yeah. it's like, you know, look at your team, the Warriors. Like you guys reinvented the three point game. And there's still people out there who pissed off that the three is such a big part of the game. Hey, get used to it. It's here. Why get ready for why that four point shot. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So you started creating. First of all, amazing stories, contemporary stories. The art got credible with some of the artists that you started bringing in at that time. It became a whole cinematic. It was just like watching a movie, but on a really nice piece of paper that I drove to the store on Wednesdays to get. I started noticing maybe five, six years after I got back into comics, as my DJ career started taking off, I'd moved from Ohio to New York. So I went from going to a really shitty comic book store in a strip mall in Cleveland to like yeah. going to like Forbidden Planet and all these like big mega things. And, and hip hop and comics started intersecting more. And you played, yeah, of course, you played yeah. a huge part of that. And if you're not a comic fan and you're a hip hop fan, you've seen these covers. And if you're a comic fan and you're not a hip hop fan, you've seen these covers. And I feel like you've probably exposed more hip hop fans to comics and more comic fans. So amazing, iconic albums for the people who don't know even what I'm talking about. Let's talk about that. What did you do? Oh, yeah, I did a thing called the Hip Hop Variants in Marvel. An initiative where we did 128 covers for comic books that were modeled on hip hop album covers, both classic and contemporary. Everything from Eric B. and Rakim and the Ultra Magnetic MCs at the beginning, all the way through you know, the Wu Tang Clan, Nas, you name it, all the way to future, you know, the track records from today. But to span time and hip hop, because my feeling is that comic books and hip hop have been engaged in a dialogue that's mostly been coming one sided. Right. And I thought to myself, you know what? So many people I know who work on comic books, when they're working, they're head bopping to hip hop. It's the soundtrack of their life. Yeah. So I thought, let's show our love for hip hop. Let's do covers that pay tribute to them. So hence, we had a ASAP Rocky cover for Captain America, Black Captain America. We had a Raekwon album, only built for Cuban links featuring the Hulk. NWA for the A-Force, it was straight out of Compton. We did these covers and it, it exploded. What was fascinating for me when I did it was that when it came out and it was announced, the politically correct police in the comic book industry came out of the woodwork to say, oh, this is cultural appropriation and blah, blah, blah. There are these asinine articles written about how Marvel is just capitalizing on hip hop. They know what they're doing. You know, they don't know hip hop, blah, blah, blah. It's just a bunch of white guys doing this. They said, I'm white, I'm mixed, I'm Mexican. All right. And second of all, you know, I'm just this old white guy who's trying to just capitalize on hip hop when they understand I grew up with hip hop. And then, the artists I work with spanned all races. When we announced the first covers, 10 of the artists of 12 we announced were Black or African American. And there was an article that came out saying that all the artists were white. Writers, I remember reading that article, actually. I remember that reading writer, that. That writer just doubled down because when he found out that Sanford Green was Black, imagine that Sanford Green was Black. When he found out, he said it didn't matter if he was white or Black, that the cover of the De La Soul record, he unmarched, it was offensive by equating Black people with mutants. It was offensive and he hated it. Then Pasta Noose of De La Soul came out and said he loved it. And the reviewer said, well, everyone's entitled to their opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say when you deal with people like this. What was amazing to me was all the artists came out of the woodwork to endorse this. Fucking Nas came out of the woodwork and said, I love this. I love it. Missy Elliott, Pete Rock, who's a friend, Method Man, you go down the list. Old school and new school people, they loved it. They loved what they saw. 
they saw how legitimate it was. This was not people faking it. This is people that felt it and were loving it. No one that did a cover was an imposter. When what you're saying, it just sparked something in my mind because I just think like when you look at classic album covers and me starting as a mixtape DJ, the amount of comic books that I aped in order to create mixtape covers were like, <laughs> right. And we were sampling you guys visually yeah. way before you were sampling us. So first of all, it's fair. It's fair. It's only fair you could sample our shit and take it back. To, but, you know, it's just as a life comes full circle moment. I feel it's all part of a pop culture continuum. Part of a pop culture continuum. In my mind, rock and roll does not own comics. Rock and roll doesn't have a monopoly over comic books. Hip hop has a claim. Yeah, a claim. absolutely. It influenced the artists and writers, regardless of their race, regardless of race. Pete Rock came into the office. There's a poster on the wall. He named every single character on the poster. He knew every single one. Love it. Talk about nerd credentials. You know, he knew everything. But I mean, if you think about even his career, that chocolate boy wonder, like he always had like superhero references in all his stuff which I really love. I guess now I'm realizing now that we're going to get into talking about this amazing company that you, you guys started. But I'm, I guess my biggest regret in my career now is never going to the Marvel offices while you were there. I never hit you up on hitting the Twitter DM like, hey man, like remember all those mixtape links I sent you? I need to get that tour. A lot of rap stars that are pissed off they don't go to the Marvel premieres anymore. <laughs> man, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure. But, but let's talk about the new stuff that you're doing. And the fact that first of all, I get to be an old man talking to somebody that created the stuff that inspired me. And then I get to be doing a podcast where I get to hold up comic books. Like this is, I can't believe this is my life. Like, you know, this is the podcast I wanted in my whole life. This podcast I'm never going to actually get in real life. But yeah, for one episode, I got to live it up, man. I can't even lie. Like that chair, I was going to put my kids like spider ham. I was going to set the whole room. Actually, are comic books that I keep on that shelf behind me. But okay, so you left Marvel. You did all these amazing things in Marvel. And you decided to go entrepreneurial and indie and start to really change the game in a different way. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Because I think a lot of the audience are people who are creatives, not comic book creatives, but just like, you know, creative sure. world, entrepreneurs, and especially now in this pandemic world with so much of the job force being fucked royally, people yeah, are trying yeah. to like figure out how can they do things on their own. So I want to kind of talk about the entrepreneurial mind state of how you got involved. Yeah, the company is called AWA, Artists, <laughs> Writers, and Artisans, and the, the main imprint they were launching the comic book imprint is called Upshot. Okay. Now the thing is what happened is after I left Marvel and I was weighing my options and thinking things through, I got a call from my old friend, Bill Jemitz, who was the president of Marvel comic books, who hired me to move from Vertigo to Marvel. And Bill said, look, me and my friend, John Miller have an idea to build a company. And we think you'd be a wonderful piece if you're interested as our partner. The idea is to build our own company, our own publisher, and that we'll do comic books. Animation will be a studio. I met his partner, John Miller. Jonathan Miller. I knew John Miller through our mutual friend, Mark Miller. And Mark Miller, who is one of the most respected and wealthy comic book writers out there, Mark Miller wrote comic books for me at Marvel. The Ultimates, right? Yeah, the Ultimates. He's a multimillionaire now because he sold his small line to Netflix. And it was Jonathan who brokered the deal for Mark. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah. So, Mark Miller spoke very highly of Jonathan. So, between Bill and Jonathan, I thought, this is an opportunity. So, I said, I'm in voice. So, I got involved as a chief creative officer. So I'm the third partner in the venture. We're fully funded. We've been up and running for two years. We started publishing in March. We launched in the middle of the pandemic. More on that later. But we're funded. Among our investors are Lightspeed Venture Capital, which is a uh, investment firm. James Murdoch, the liberal son of Rupert Murdoch, the former chairman of 20th Century Fox, who just resigned his spot on the Fox board recently, and his sister, Liz Murdoch, and sister group. So we have some very heavy hitters in the world of media. So what we're doing is we're building two things. We're building a publisher. One facet of what we're doing is create our own. Books that like Preacher or The Walking Dead exist in their own universe. But another thing we're doing is we're building our own shared universe. A new universe like what Marvel has or what DC has, where characters live in the same world, but for the same stakes. So when I decided that I was going to do this, build a shared universe, I thought, well, I need someone a lot smarter than me to lay down the groundwork. Who better than my old friend, J. Michael Straczynski, who created Babylon 5 and Sensei for Netflix and wrote Spider-Man and Thor and World War Z. Only one problem, Joe Straczynski retired from comic books. So I think wow. I got to go to L.A. So I go to his house, his mansion in L.A., this house, oh my God. So I go there, my legs are trembling because it's all nothing, but I'm trying to play it cool. So I go in, I say, hey, Joe, long time no see. I got a new thing. I got a new company. We're going to do comic books, creator owned and otherwise, because I want to build a shared universe. And he said to me, you know what? I was kind of hoping you were going to say something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
So we sat there for a couple of hours and had lemonade, and we talked about Share Universe, what it could be. We agreed, it's high time for someone to create a new universe that reflects the world now. The DC universe was created in the 40s and 50s. The characters are analogous to the Times and their cops, the law enforcement officials. The Marvel characters are built in the 60s and 70s, and their counterculture. But all these characters are dated. You can refresh them. You can look to make Black Panther new, a little bit refresh, get Ta-Nehisi culture, but you have them to write them, you know? But again, at the end of the day, you're still a character who's been around for decades, who's rooted in other time. So it was very important to us that we create a universe that is rooted in today, that reflects what people are worried about today, what they're scared about today, and the world now. So we said, let's create a world. So if we want to have people who are super-powered, let's also do this. Rather than having a world in which people get their powers because they got bit by a radioactive aardvark, let's have an event that creates people. So we decided we were going to do a tragic event that would result in widespread death and destruction, but also the birth of a new species of superhuman. So these people would be born under a cloud. They would be born of a tragedy. So I said to Joe, what do you think about that? And he said, yeah. He said, you know what? It should be a pandemic. <laughs> And I said, yeah. And he said, he said, people aren't worried about nuclear war now. They're worried about super flus. They're worried about the big plague that comes along that antibiotics can't fight. That's what people are worried about now. When was this conversation? Two years ago. Two years before COVID. I have a feeling his house is about to get double the size in about two more years, my friend. <laughs> yeah. He's got a lot more <laughs> lemonade. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. I couldn't believe it. So anyway, so we've been working on the book called The Resistance. We launched The Resistance, this book right there, the one in which a new super universe is created in the wave of a pandemic called the Great Death. The Great Death kills about one-tenth of the global population. Wow. And a small percentage of people come back with superpowers. And the world is scared. What just happened? Who are these people with superpowers? Are they responsible for the death and destruction? Issue one came out the week of the quarantine. Amazing. Crazy timing, which was a bummer from a sales perspective because people weren't going to stores. But it was also not a lot of attention. But the thing is that what's interesting about the book is that in our book, what happens is after the event, the world starts to embrace fascism out of fear. Sound familiar? (laughs) Around the world, people are refuting Western democracy in favor of iron-handed rule. It's arguable even here in the United States. People are putting aside Western democracy in favor of a fascist branded government. So I think our book is pretty timely. It's about fighting fascism in the world now. But again, that said... Our book is about hope. I love that. Do you think it's ironic that, you know, as you you talk about how people are reacting to this virus in the real world and people, how certain people are like leaning into this ridiculous government situation that we have going on right now, and they're rebelling amazingly against wearing masks, right? (laughs) And when you think about the masks, then you think about the concept of what you're describing, where it's almost like a weird synergy. Like, you know, everybody as a kid wanted to be a superhero. Everybody as a kid wanted to be anonymous. Yeah. Everybody as a kid wanted to be safe. And now people are literally rebelling against, I mean, I go to Target all the time. There are anything if families buying their kids superhero toys while refusing to put their families in masks to me. is Yeah, it's insane. It's, it's a what the fuck moment. Everything is political now. Everything is politicized. There's a chasm between right and left. And a lot of people on the right view it as being like, a, you're infringing my freedom. They equate not wearing a mask with free and macho. But you think about it, past generations went to war to protect their country. They went to war. That sacrifice. These people won't even wear a mask to protect old people and the weak. I felt like comics were always like, everybody can be a hero. And now here's everybody's literally one chance in life to be a hero every time they walk out of their house. And humanity yeah. is, is yeah. fucking it up on the highest level. The easiest thing to do is be a good citizen. Be a yeah. good citizen. And people can't even do that. So again, in our book, we feel like we're building a new universe that's rooted in the 21st century. I want a universe that my kids can relate to. Right. The world that is now. A world where there's lots of mixed people, people from all all over the world, different shapes and sizes, different attitudes, having to survive. It's about more than New York. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be great to see uh, how this pandemic totally like puts a huge vitamin into something you've put your blood, sweat, and tears in for the last two years. Yeah. You know, the fact that you said you're doing great, even while stores were closed and, you know, people yeah. were in a shock, that's pretty exciting. I don't know how, like, the big two is doing in this regard, but it's really yeah. awesome to see you guys doing well. The amazing thing for us is that all of our books sold out. Every single book we put out sold out. There's buzz on the street and the stores about what we're doing. They're excited to see how things get linked up. And the thing is that not a single book has underperformed. 
we could on second printings on four books, but we opted not to because we want to keep the buzz on the books going for the trade down the road. Right. I think a lot of people who probably are into comics now, they actually are buying trades and they don't actually know they're buying exactly. trades. So when you go to like the Barnes and Nobles and the really fancy bookstores and you see a comic book that has like the hardcover with six to eight issues in it, like you're buying a season, right? And that's actually really <laughs> interesting too, because you were pretty early on adopting that model too at, at Marvel <laughs> and now as well. You took the Netflix model essentially of uh, binge watching and you applied binge it to exactly, comics exactly. with great success. That's what we're doing with AWA, we're doing right now. Resistance, volume one, the episode's out now is season one. Straczynski's already written volume two. Season two is written and being drawn. And all of our books will be like that. We'll have a season one, season two, season three, season four. But as long as people want it, we'll keep doing seasons. Could you ever see a model where somebody's actually releasing six issues the same day instead of like releasing a monthly and then compiling them for like just in a true yeah. like Netflix kind of model? Yeah, yeah. The thing is, though, what it means is you got to get a, a big head start because you need to have all that stuff created and it ready to ship right. on that day. So it means you got to decide you're going to be committing to making your money back sometimes two years down the road. Right. So again, building a publishing plan, my goal is to always keep stuff on the racks and to always have trades out there that people can read. At some point, I think we'll do that. Year Zero is another book we did. It's a global look at the zombie apocalypse. It did very well. We have a second season already underway. When the collection comes out, the trade for the first season, the next month, season two will hit the stores. So you can binge that way. Read the first trade and then keep start reading the book the next season. Oh, that's, that's, a good smart. that's good timing. Even this NBA bubble thing is like binge watching in a way because they have so many <laughs> games. You can watch games from like, it's like watching the Final Four. There's games at noon. There's games at night. It's going to be really fascinating. So we'll talk about basketball for one minute and then we'll wrap because I just know you're a huge hoops head. And yeah. I know the Warriors are your team, right? Yeah, I grew up with the Warriors. When I was a little boy, Rick Barry won the championship. I played basketball. As a young man, I shot like Lord B3 with a huge arc. Rick Did Barry, you do the underhand? No, we didn't go that far. No, no, no. But Lord B3, will be free. we all shot like him. High arc. And then I suffered through everything. All those teams. The greatest night was when I watched the Warriors beat that Mavericks team when they were the eighth seed against yeah. the one. And of course, the modern day Warriors. The love of my life. I love it. It's almost interesting when you look at them this year, or I guess I guess it's still this year because it's still the same season. They're the first ever worst team in the league that nobody even considers that. It's like they just don't even no. exist. It's just like a blip because you know next, yeah. next year they're coming back insane. And so they can always get fired. They didn't even want to do the bubble. They were like, man, if you invite us to the bubble, we might sit this shit out, but we're going to send like the G League or <laughs> like we're not even sending like our people. Like we're good. I think that's fascinating. It's so Bay, too. It's so like Silicon Valley. It's so like, I love it. Look, that team is scary. That team is really scary. Look, I'm a coach. I coach rec league basketball, travel basketball. When I look at the assets on the Warriors, the potential is there. When Curry and Clay come back, all bets are off. I just realized, and I never thought about this till right now, but when LeBron went to Miami, and even when you look at back the 80s with the Celtics and the 90s with the Bulls, people referred to them as super teams. Mm -hmm. I've never drawn the comic book analogy to that till right now. That like, you know, even just using the word super in that was absolutely referencing a group of, you know, heroes uniting to do yeah, something yeah. really, really cool. That's crazy. I never thought about it like that. And truth be told is that, you know, as much as I loved Durant being on the Warriors, it was a little bit too much of an embarrassment of riches. I find it easier to root for the Warriors now where they have to fight harder. Right. Because they're good enough to win. But again, it's not like they're such a super team that they're just stacked from top to bottom. I like the chemistry of Clay, Green, and Curry, you know? Right. I like seeing those three control the ball. Is that like, you know, 15 years ago when you guys put Wolverine on the Avengers and the whole fucking oh, yeah, world broke loose? Is that like, was it that yeah. one guy that, because he, he switched? I mean, if it, I never, this yeah. could be a great medium post one day, but it's just like, you took yeah. the best player on the X-Men, you put him on the yeah. Avengers, and everybody was fucking mad. You can't put Wolverine on yeah, the that, Avengers. Yeah, it was a very big do, deal. You do, and then you double sales. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it's a very good analogy, yeah. That's funny. And they, well, they did it and now they doubled their billions. <laughs> so it worked out, it worked yeah, exactly. out good for everyone. Yeah, brilliant. yeah. One thing we like to do before we close these podcasts out is just four really quick kind of rapid fire questions here. And because I have a huge, huge ego, we named them after my initials, Mick. So it's gonna, it's almost <laughs> like a game of horse, if you will, but a game of Mick. So M is music, which I know we kind of touched on a lot already, but What's one song, or for you, we could even do one album that has like you know significant meaning to your life? The one album that I always come back to and feel the same way about it, it always, always, always puts me in a mood 
is the infamous Mob Deep. Mm. Stripped down, minimalistic, timeless. Illmatic is an amazing record, but if I had to pick an album I listened to from beginning till end, and I just absolutely there, the infamous Mob Deep, the first album. Well, I guess the second album, technically, but yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because it's sonically cohesive. Like it's the same vibe through the whole album too. Like exactly. where Illmatic goes as classic as it is, it yeah. goes in different places. For me, it would be probably Midnight Marauders. But if yeah. you think Q-Tip had his hands all over that infamous album that you're speaking of too, so you could hear like the cohesiveness yeah, of it. Is yeah. like he was the unified editor in chief of his yeah, you're, projects, you're, right? Low End Theory's up there too for the same reason. Yeah, Low End Theory just again underrated, but just an amazing record. And I was fortunate enough to become friends with Prodigy, the late Prodigy. My 13-year-old self pinched myself when I met him, you know? I would say that, yeah, Infamous Mob Deep is the record, the one record that, because I'm going to pick an album as opposed to a song. That's the one. So I would be, if you could fix one world problem, what would it be? One world problem. Well, it doesn't Hmm. even have to be a world problem. It could be a societal problem. It could be an American problem. Any problem. Well, I mean, the disease of racism. Good luck with that. Yeah. I mean, you've kind of attempted to do that, too, in in your publishing, too, which is there's definitely going to be a lot of kids being raised on these books and these movies that are going to look a little bit different at diversity than what their parents said and what they saw their grandparents do because of some of the, you know, the pop culture stuff you guys have created. So I think it's very important. And I think that, you know, you and I both know what it's like to raise a mixed race kid. My daughter speaks Spanish, English and Korean. You know, she's four years old. And she looks Korean, so when people speak Spanish around her, she knows what they're saying, and she, she speaks to them, and they're freaked out. Like, what the hell? <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> That's amazing. My son needs to get his language game up. We got to work on that. But he's starting to learn the DJ, which is kind of cool. I overemphasize, my daughter is gibberish, but it's, you know what hey, I mean? <laughs> You know what's interesting, though? It's it's just to tie it back, like, his favorite song in Spider-Verse was the Post Malone, uh, you know, Sway Lee song the, uh, with like, Sunflower. And he yeah. gravitated towards the Spanish version. That's great. Uh, and he doesn't actually know Spanish, but because yeah. of that song, like he learned the words to that. And I was like, wow. And he was maybe three at the time. And I thought that was really, really interesting. So maybe, again, you're subconsciously making my kid more, more lingual. But my daughter knows when we're in the car driving, if it's bachata or a reggaeton, she knows it's my wife. But if a hip hop song comes on, my daughter says to me, Appa, you like this song, right? <laughs> if it's oh. No, that's Appa's music. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Maybe I need to play my son Shook ones and see what he says. Probably or the instrumental at least, right? <laughs> Got to wait, wait a few years on that. All right, C, what's the craziest, craziest risk you've ever taken? And was it worth it? Craziest risk? Let me think. Um, was it going to comics from journalism? I think maybe craziest risk might have been jumping to Marvel when Marvel was in Chapter 11. Ah. The stock price was $1.40. Anytime someone knew walked the halls, the editors who'd been there for years thought, oh, we're going to get sold and be out of a job. <laughs> and I would be like, ah, whatever, you know, because I didn't mean there long enough to be scared. That's one thing. I probably said that's probably the biggest one because uh, that had the biggest payoff in terms of life experience to make the jump to a company that's on the rails and then uh, be part of it turning around. Nice. And the last one, K, key life lesson you'll always carry with you from somebody that you admire. Best advice anybody ever gave you. Good one. When I was in seventh grade, there was a kid, Joe Batista, used to kick my ass all the time. I was really good at basketball, but I wasn't tough. He didn't like the fact that I was better than him. So he would rough me up and he would bully me. And I was scared to fight him. My mom wanted to talk to the teachers. One day, my dad, who is the most gentle man you'll ever meet, he pulled me aside. He said, Papa, you said, listen, there's some problems that you have to solve for yourself. We can't solve them for you. You have to solve this. The next time he messes with you, you need to hit him as hard as you can in the face before it can react. After that, he's going to beat you up because I've seen him and I know you. So I said, understand, he'll beat you up. But, but he said, understand, when it's over, he won't bother you again. And if the teachers are mad at you, you won't be in trouble at home. In fact, I'll buy you a pizza for dinner. (laughs) So a few days later, Joe Batista messed with me. I hit him in the face. Blood went all over his face, down his shirt. He hit me. Blood went all over my shirt. We started fighting. He beat me up. And then the teachers got mad at us. I got a pizza. And then Joe and me became best fucking friends. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Shortly after, we went to see George Clinton together. Me and him and his older brother. So yeah, we became really good friends. 
because he was just need to see me fighting back. That's What's crazy. Up, bros? Yeah. Great advice from my dad. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. I got to one day give my kid that same. Well, hopefully he doesn't get bullied, but you know, no, that, yeah, I agree. Right. You got to stand up for your own shit. Right. Dude. Thank you, man. I know you have a lot going on with this new company and all the amazing Thank stuff you. that you guys are putting out. Once this quarantine is over, we got together and hang. All right. And then yeah. Yeah. We will do this long awaited uh, Brooklyn hang. It'll be fun. Sounds good. Uh, peace, and uh, peace. my best to your family during these times too. You as well. You as well. Stay safe. And that was it for another episode of The Mix Show. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We sincerely appreciate it. Please, please, please do us a favor, wherever it is that you listen to your favorite podcast. Please, please subscribe to The Mix Show. Like The Mix Show. Write a review for The Mix Show. Leave a star rating for The Mix Show. Whatever you can do helps. Five stars would be amazing. Four stars would be cool. 4.5. I was never an A-plus student in school. I was like that B-plus guy. So anything in that range, more than grateful for. Also, make sure you follow on social, Instagram, at Mick, Twitter, at I am Mick. Let me know who you want to see on a future episode of The Mick Show so we can try to get them on for you. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in, and we will see you back here next week. Thank you.